our next conversation, Golden Globe Trotters, a new model for Hollywood media and entertainment. Please welcome interviewer Manit Ahuja, editor at large, Forbes, and founder, Iconoclast, and panelist Jay Penske, chairman, founder, and CEO, Penske Media Corporation, and CEO, Dick Clark Productions, and Todd Bowley, co-founder, chairman, and CEO, Eldridge yeah, Industries. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be joined by two incredible visionaries here who have teamed up to run one of the most iconic entertainment empires of our time, Todd Boley and Jay Penske. Last year, Eldridge and Penske Media Corporation teamed up, acquired, and reimagined the Golden Globes, bringing the story to award show back to rarefied air in record time. While part of that story was told in our annual Global Billionaires issue, Today's conversation will go beyond the page and take a deep dive into their custom playbook. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you, Manit. Uh, so nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. So Todd, Jay, you're both known for developing strong relationships. And Todd, you've spoken a bit about how relationships are an important form of currency. So inquiring minds want to know, how did you two first get connected? Well, I had just bought The Hollywood Reporter because I lost my mind and uh, <laughs> thought that I would get into this intellectual property business. And really, it was after the global financial crisis and the markets had healed and we were kind of looking for our next idea. And so I was trying to figure out who was going to, to run it. And I was given a name and I started calling this individual to see if they would come run the Hollywood Reporter. And I got a cease and desist letter from Jay. <laughs> so he really? sent me a wow. he sent me he start. sent me a nasty <laughs> gram, and uh, he basically told me you know stay away, and uh, if you try to hire this person, I'm going to sue you. I think we need to set the record okay, straight. Okay, so the Todd is was a wrestler in high school, and I think. He wanted to make sure that uh, it was at least tough enough or we were going to be good long-term partners. So we wrestled a little bit as competitors before we became long-term partners. And uh, Todd today and I are partnered on eight of the 35 businesses in our portfolio. And uh, Eldridge and Todd have been super partners for us uh, over the last uh, bunch of years. So what turned the tide? Well, we got together <laughs> and uh, spent some time. And we realized that we were more alike than different. And, um, you know, Jay had been working on me for, for quite some time to combine our businesses. And I kept being so frustrated because he was doing so well and I wasn't doing quite as well. So finally, I agreed that the combination of the businesses made a lot of sense. And, you know, I think that took probably five years or so, six years, uh, until we first met, uh, since we first met. And, Jay's done an amazing job building this platform. I think there's every day one of three people hit one of his websites. Mm -hmm. So by being able to transform these unbelievable brands away from a magazine and into a digital platform, you know, and then really scale those, you know, he's done just an amazing job. So it's just been a pleasure to be his partner. And Jay, what, what do you think about how it's really like working with Todd? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Well, after the cease and desist, no. Uh, I think when you just think about the amount of things and companies that are in the Eldridge portfolio, uh, it's uh, just astounding. Uh, they've got, from what I know, over 100 businesses, a uh, couple thousand employees. But, you know, they, they believe in the entrepreneurs they back. Uh, they're long-term investors. They really, I think, uh, unlike so many, don't just say that but actually practice, uh, you know, permanent long-term capital. And for people that want to build generational assets and transform businesses, there's not many better partners that we've found than Eldridge. So taking a deeper dive into your businesses like you talked about, media rights and intellectual property are a focal point in both of your investment portfolios. Talk to me a little bit about the investment thesis. Jay, why don't we start with you? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, similar to Eldridge, uh, over the last decade, we're constantly looking for a unique uh, and what I'd say is sui generis opportunities for IP and brands. 
it, it is very, very hard to build brands today. Uh, let me correct myself. It's very hard to build sustainable brands today with all of the noise and content and information that is across social media and the internet. You can build something quickly, but likely not sustainable. So when we find that unique space where you've got a brand that has history, it's trusted, uh, but needs some transformation, we think these intellectual property meets you know, historic legacy brands is a really unique place for us to invest, and it's proven to be a very good thesis for, for the company. And Todd? Sure. As distribution costs have come down, you know, intellectual property continues, in my opinion, to, to go up in value. And as Jay said, you know, trusted brands. I mean, if you look at Billboard, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Rolling Stone, you know, these are all 100-year-old brands, right? And they've been around and stood the test of time. Right. The billboard charts, you know, are something that everyone thinks about. 1930. And, you know, launched in 1930, yeah. And you look at the top musicians, and one of their first questions always is like, how do I make, what, well, how do I get onto the billboard charts? What do I need to do? Right? Because it's a sign of success. And one of the things that, you know, Jay's been really able to do is, you know, build on top of that intellectual property and really gather audiences. I mean, the audiences that he reaches, you know, all, uh, every day, um, it's just a staggering amount of number because he's got these brands. And when you walk into, you know, a, a, an agency in Hollywood, what do you see? The first thing you see on the coffee table is you see Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Billboard, Rolling Stone. These are all very trusted. And then, of course, he's been able to take that and really build it into a digital business uh, that, you know, is gathering just people all around the world, you know, with his tremendous content. All that being said, though, there has been a retrenchment across the entertainment industry, and the world is being impacted across all mediums from TV to film. How are you both future-proofing your brands to be successful in such a rapidly evolving environment? Well, I'd say, first and foremost, it's a fallacy that media businesses can survive on single forms of revenue uh, or single streams of revenue. So I think in, in our case at Penske Media, we're constantly looking at what other areas do we need to be good to excellent in, in terms of monetization of our content. So whether it's licensing, it's subscription, it's direct and indirect advertising, it's live events like Forbes is doing here today, you have to do more. You have to be a multi-channel business. And when you see Netflix, I think it was announced 48 hours ago, when you see a business like Netflix, which is so strong in subscription, um, launching these new live experiential centers called Netflix houses across the U.S., you see that even Netflix, with such a strong core business, is trying to expand its portfolio and also its revenue streams, just like Disney has done so well with its IP across the theme park. So we think to, f to future-proof it, it's all about making sure that any of these big transformations that come or disruptions, you have to have revenue from multiple sources. Todd? Yeah, I think revenue from multiple sources is obviously key. Um, you know, I think you also have to you know, be thinking uh, about how are you differentiated, right? And how is it that you get, you know, the content that people want to see, that people want to read? You know, and then, of course, you know, in the business that, that Jay's in, you have to be super fiscally responsible, right? So watching him kind of run the businesses day in and day out, he's constantly pushing people on, you know, how, you know, where are they spending money? Where are they investing money? How are they thinking about, you know, future? Where are they going to go get the revenue, right? But what he has is access to massive amounts of luxury brands. So if you look at the brands that want to associate with them, because of the equity that he has in these brands, mm -hmm. you know, he's got Louis Vuitton, he's got Chanel, he's got all the big brands that are super excited. You know, he was also extremely well positioned during COVID and we were able to buy you know, half of South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. So now what he's doing is he's taking South by Southwest all around the world, right? So we launched programming in Australia. He's headed to Europe. He's headed to the Middle East. And yeah. you know, these are iconic ideas. And then of course he can activate them by using his sales force and really monetize them for the people who are actually putting on you know, the South by Southwest all around the world. So you see kind of the playbook that he has because he's got an unbelievable sales force, right? And he's got unbelievable content. Mm -hmm. And that content wants to connect with, you know, other brands that are seeking the attachment to the equity. It's that multiplier effect, yeah, so absolutely. to speak. 
And so let's take it back to the U.S. for a minute. And we mentioned the Golden Globes. Viewership was in, back in January up 51%, Nielsen reported. And you both inked a deal with CBS and Paramount Plus for the next six years. What's next for the Golden Globes? What's your vision there? I'd say to start uh, live TV specials is a team sport. You need everyone rowing the same direction. And I think when we bought the... Uh, this business a few years ago, uh, the Golden Globes was definitely in last place. It was definitely at the bottom of the standings. And to fast forward to the things you just mentioned and to look at this year and see that the Golden Globes is larger than the Emmys, the SAG Awards, and the Tony Awards, which happened uh, about a week or so ago, uh, all combined is really extraordinary. And it's a real testament to the incredible team at Dick Clark Productions, uh, the, the producers, the director, and also that CBS took a risk. This wasn't an easy risk. NBC had passed on the property. We were in a tough, tough space. George Cheeks, the CEO of CBS, really took a risk. And you know, to go from where we were to where we are today and have a long-term deal with CBS, uh, you know, I think the sky is the limit for, for the Golden Globes, both domestically and the opportunities internationally for us to continue to expand the brand are, are many. And uh, yes, hopefully one day we'll be knocking on the doors uh, in terms of the size of audience of the Oscars. And, I hope that happens very soon. And Todd, I, I was lucky enough to get a chance to observe both of you live there in January as part of the story process. Um, what was your analysis and assessment of you know, how, how things turned out? Well, I lived with it for a couple of years. Um, and you know, obviously, they, uh, uh, they self-destructed. And you know, they ultimately um, uh, you know, were kind of stranded, right? They had a couple things happen to them. COVID happened, uh, and then there was a, you know, a, a retaliation against kind of the membership. And it was all self-inflicted, but it really came down to really bad governance. I mean, the governance of the organization dated back, you know, to, you know, decades and decades and decades ago. And when you have these organizations that make it so hard to change governance, they atrophy and they don't evolve. And so their inability to evolve, you know, put them in a, you know, a, a tricky spot. I think, you know, now we have voters all around the world. We've expanded the voter base, you know, with experts. Um, and we've really got people who are excited about being involved. Uh, and I think there's still, in my opinion, no better party, mm -hmm. right? You've got this tremendous environment where you know, you have a, a look into, you know, the, the, the social life of, you know, the celebrity and the stars that you grow up with. And that's unique. Instagram and everything, social media has taken away kind of that specialty of seeing, you know, a celebrity. But the idea of seeing a celebrity in an environment like that, where they're among their peers, they're having a couple cocktails, they're celebrating, you know, and, you know, they're excited about winning. Uh, they're, you know, so it's now, hopefully, you know, the way we see it, it's one of the big three, mm -hmm. right? You've got the Oscars, the Grammys, and the Globes. And the Globes are well positioned because they're the only one who really combines both film and TV. Right. So as those two mediums evolve, right, you're not exposed to one or the other, but you've got a more of a portfolio approach. And like Jay did with South by Southwest and really started to think about how to expand that, you know, I would expect that you'll see something similar with, with the Globes. So I want to transition to your broader investment portfolio, which we got a chance to kind of dive into a bit at Eldridge. Your investment strategy is quite similar to Warren Buffett's, you know, in <laughs> terms nice. of that at the center, <laughs> the cash generated from the insurance benefit, uh, from the insurance business, security benefit, helps to, you know, fuel your other investments. Can you talk to us a little bit about that approach? We're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of that happening now in the asset management industry. Sure. An insurance company has to have its assets managed, right? So you have a choice on how do you want to do that. Do you want to build a team that does it? Do you want to build teams that then do it? Or do you want to outsource it? So you've got one team, you've got many teams, and you've got outsourcing. We chose to build many teams. You know, so what we can do is we can put some equity capital into a business, 
give a team a mandate and then start an investment strategy where they have an anchor tenant. Right? So we make the rates of return that come from the asset strategy, but then we also get the benefit of the enterprise value as we build it, right? that then we can do something with that you know, and reinvest it back into continue to grow and compound the insurance company. So the liabilities that we have are pretty straightforward. Right? They're annuities. Right? And we're hitting peak 65 right now. Over the next four years, there's going to be more people that turn 65 in the US than at any other period of time. So what do people want when they start to think about kind of the a consumption stage versus the accumulation stage? Right? They want to think about what am I going to get paid every month? Right? They don't really start, they stop to care about rates of return and IRRs and they want to know how much cash is showing up every month. Mm -hmm. Right? So by having kind of credit and credit strategies, you know, we've been you know, able to continue to grow and service those, those long-term liabilities. And the other thing that's great about them is that they aren't bullets, right? So they term out and they have long tails, right? But there's never an event that causes a, you know, a, a, a big mark to market, mm -hmm. right? Where you have a rush to kind of the bank, so to speak. A, there are they're tax advantages for keeping in place. And B, right, they're compounding. And, you know, depending on how we built and structured an annuity, right, sometimes the surrender value is less than the benefit base. And so when someone calculates how they turn on their income, right, if their benefit base is 120% of their account value, right, they're going to be loath to want to take that money out because they want to convert it into income based on mm -hmm. the benefit base. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been, um, you know, a, a good business. And I think that as the world continues to age and we're seeing lots of interest for building insurance companies overseas, mm -hmm. right? There's literally not an insurance company, uh, you know, in, in Saudi, for example, mm -hmm. right? But Saudi wants an insurance industry and they just changed the governance of it because they have very long-term projects and insurance liabilities go really nicely with long-term projects and long-term assets, they match very nicely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the, the, the insurance industry is going to continue to grow. So you also said being a lender gives you a front row seat to a lot of different industries. What industries are out there right now that you find are the most exciting that maybe you haven't really delved into yet? So, or you have. Yeah, I think right now we're looking at ideas on how to provide financing to companies that are in a transition period where they're going from being, let's call it, consuming capital to generating capital. And there's a whole host of these businesses where maybe they raised venture capital or growth equity in 2021 or 2022, and they're not looking to do a down round per se, so they're looking to do some types of structured finance where you, know, you might be at the top of the capital structure, right? and you have to believe and do the work in order to get comfortable that there's value there. You know, because of course, you know, if, a, if a business is right at that precipice where it's going from you know, consuming capital to generating capital, um, you just have to make sure that there's a strategic reason Right, because one of the dirty little secrets of lending businesses, money, uh, money to businesses, is that the businesses almost always never pay you back. Mm -hmm. Right, it's someone else that comes in and pays you back. It's someone else who buys the company. It's a refinancing. But once the business establishes, you know, the debt, it's really not the business that pays it off. It's the attractiveness of the business to other forms of capital that pays you off. So you're always thinking about, right, what is the value of this business and to who is it worth what? Mm -hmm. And so, Jay, over the past decade and a half, you've made a ton of acquisitions, major print media brands from Variety, Rolling Stone, Hollywood Reporter, Billboard. These investments occurred at a time when interest in print media seemed a bit lackluster. What drove that confidence for you to drive right in? Let's say first give you a perspective on how we look at uh, uh, the media industry. I think we're not a traditional private equity fund or a, uh, you know, we really are an operator, owner-operator of these media assets. And so I think we first take the look that 
you know, this is going to be something that we're going to be invested in and operating for 25 to 50 years. And so do we want to invest in something? We have to really get deep with the management team. Are we, have we just fallen in love with the brand? Or are we really sure that the team that's there can handle this digital transformation? Uh, the second part is, you know, is this an industry that in the mid to long term that we think with that digital transformation this business will be able to climb out of? And then, as I talked about earlier, this ability to create new revenue streams for these businesses that were so reliant on just a single form of revenue for the last, you know, some as long as 100 years. Um, but it's about the people. I mean, these are really people-intensive businesses, from the editors, as you know, um, to the sales teams, to the teams working on subscription and live events. Uh, it is very people-intensive. Uh, but when you have a long trajectory and when you really believe that you want to own this business 25, 50 years from now, you're making decisions that I think are so much healthier for the near-term success of these, uh, these brands. So we're almost out of time, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question about AI as it's disrupting all industries and what that means for the media industry personally and for, you know, frankly, everybody in this room. What are your thoughts there on the opportunity but also the potential risk? Well, I'd say, first of all, um, I think it's AI is not a panacea. Uh, for the media industry, and it's certainly not the death of the media industry. Uh, I think many of our peers have done deals, uh, recent deals with OpenAI and a couple others, but I think our strategy at Penske Media has been very different. We look at this and say, it's a, the wrong time to do a deal with an, an AI company when they haven't figured out their business model. When they don't yet know how they're going to generate long-term sustainable revenue, let's wait a bit. And, uh, from, and not just look at them as an ATM, but really look at them as a strategic partner to build applications, to build products, um, to try to transform our newsroom in terms of efficiency, to look at workflows. Um, these are the ways we're looking at the AI companies. And as they continue to develop, this is still early, early innings, as it continues to develop, then lean in and try to find more strategic uh, routes. But it's not going to be the end. Uh, we've already dealt with the internet. You've dealt with mobile. Uh, and now AI is, I think, the, the next big transformation. But it's something that I think can be managed well, but not looking at it as, as it's some kind of panacea or death uh, for the media industry. So we have less than two minutes left. So I want to transition to a lightning round. Uh -oh. So that's both of you, quick, fast answers. So Todd, let's start with you. Best and worst investment. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm right here. But, or worst. Best uh, yeah. or worst. <laughs> I can't say Jay because he's sitting here, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, what I, when, when, when I did the deal to contribute Billboard and Hollywood Reporter, I was consuming about 20 million bucks, and now he's making, you know, EBITDA more than nine figures. So watching what he's done has been tremendous. Um, I, uh, my worst thing was I owned 1,100 Pizza Hut franchises. Oh, yes. Yeah, which was a... <laughs> I thought when the world went to crap, everyone would eat pizza and drink beer, and they didn't want Pizza Hut. They wanted Domino's, so I chose poor <laughs> yeah. um, uh, So that was a, a frustrating one um, for a whole host of reasons that, you know, not really going to get into. Jay? Uh, 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 the best investment. Every time I leave the office and go watch my daughter play sports uh, or in a play, uh, the, the worst investment was when I had the opportunity to buy uh, to be one of the buyers of Forbes, uh, and I didn't take it. Probably my worst, uh, worst investment. I'd agree with that. <laughs> and okay, so final question: Which city has the best sports fans? Todd. Best is so complicated. <laughs> you're you're going to be stretched on this. One. I mean, you know, this is a. <laughs> Doesn't have know, to be in the U.S. <laughs> no, I, in listen, the UK. I, I, listen. I think all fans are passionate, no matter what city you're in. You know, so I'm not smart enough to tell you what's the best, but I know that they're super passionate. And whether you look at Dodgers fans or Lakers fans, you look at what's going on with the Dodgers with Shohei Otani, and you look at just the Lakers legacy, and, and obviously you know, the fans at Chelsea and, and uh, football are, are just absolutely committed. So I'm not going to answer the question. Jake. Uh, Jets, Mets, and Rangers, New York All City. Right. Very All right, easy. guys. Well, we're out of time. Thank you both. Thank you very so much. much. Thank you, Manit. Really a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. You.